I'm going to start out by kind of asking you a question. Would you agree with me that reminders are a good thing? You know, whether it's a dentist appointment or your car telling you that you need to change the oil, I think most of us would agree that reminders are, are good, a good thing. They're helpful. And if you're like me, you probably find reminders are essential. You know, next week, uh, Eleanor, Eleanor and I are on vacation. You know, for as long as I can remember, in October, we've taken a week off because that's when our anniversary is. And so we want to spend time celebrating, but also remembering that. You know, I think as, as a church, remembering is also important. You know, after all, you know, monthly, we remember that Jesus' sacrifice, we take part of communion, we, you know, looking to what Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. You know, our study in Isaiah, there has been much focus on the coming Messiah. The servant who would bring forth righteousness, who would bring sight to the blind, who would set prisoners free. And all, with all this talk of the servant in the book of Isaiah, I thought it might be helpful for us to take a Sunday and make sure we remember the primary message of the servant. You know, take time remembering the message, how, how that should impact our lives today. Because there's always a danger. There's always a danger that we as individuals, we as a church, oh, we might be familiar with the term gospel, but we don't remember how to unpack the implications of the gospel message in our daily lives. And I think it's really easy for, for the gospel to kind of lose clarity in our lives. And at the risk of sounding kind of Paul trippish, I think it's really easy for us to suffer from gospel amnesia. Forgetting that the gospel is to impact every part of our life. You know, part of my motive here this morning is, is I recognize, you might have picked this up this morning, but we're children heavy. Right? Praise the Lord for that. You know, I'm, we're so grateful for that. And I would not change that really for anything. But it also means this. I think we need to be diligent to encourage parents to see the importance of helping their children see the riches of the gospel in their family life. Amen? Does that make sense? But the truth is, regardless of whether or not we have children, Every follower of Jesus Christ needs to be exploring the riches of the gospel. Now, I have to admit something this morning. Part of and much of what I'm sharing this morning spawned from Tim Keller's book called Center Church, which is really a book that explores the implication of the gospels to have in our daily lives. In fact, the outline for this particular message you, you find closely would resemble a, a titled chapter or called The Gospel Affects Everything. So just as it's a good idea to remember your doctor's appointment, good idea to remember to change the oil in your car, really good idea for couples to remember and celebrate their anniversary, for a follower of Jesus Christ, it is crucial that we remember that the gospel is to affect everything in our life. Hence the title of this message, The Gospel Affects Everything. And you will notice today that I do kind of pick on parents a little bit today. Not because the truth isn't important to everyone, it is. But if you have kids, and especially if they're still at home, I feel the stakes are just that much higher for you. And I'll explain that as I go along. But before we do that, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time. And Lord, we just want to give you special thanks for your son the Messiah, the king who became servant, who was rich, but became poor for us. Lord, and I just pray, Lord, that you would just help us to see that as a pattern for our life, the demand that it puts on us to emulate that in our own lives. Lord, help me to speak clearly. And I just pray, Lord, that your spirit would convict those that or maybe struggling in this area. And if there is someone here today 
that hasn't yet embraced the gospel for themselves, I pray that today would be that day. So we ask this in the name of your Son. Amen. Now, you might be thinking that a sermon that emphasizes our need to internalize the gospel, well, John, that seems a little obvious. But I, I suspect that for most of us, internaling the gospel daily is more difficult than the reality. I think, I know it is for me. Because the, really the danger, or the, rea sorry, the reality of the gospel, it needs to penetrate our life every day. And the danger is this. If there is an area in your life and in my life, it, it, maybe the life of our family, that the gospel is not impacting, I'm telling you, it, it, it can have, or should I say, it will have a very damaging effect. Don Carson, writing about the book of 1 Corinthians, makes this very important point, examining Paul's writings. He concludes that essentially Paul in 1 Corinthians expresses throughout the whole book the idea that the gospel needs to influence every area of our life. Think of the implications of that, right? It means for individuals, for couples, for families, every decision that you and I make, every area of our life, it needs to reflect the outworking of the gospel. In other words, the gospel is to transform all our activities. But before we start looking at how the gospel is to be continually transforming our life, let's make sure that we're on the same page in terms of what is the gospel. The gospel, of course, means good news, the good news that what Jesus has done to rescue humanity. I love how John Piper unpacks the gospel makes it very understandable. Actually, there's a fairly short YouTube video that I'd recommend watching, but paraphrasing and condensing, let me just put it this way. He says, this is a plan, he's speaking about the gospel, this is a plan from eternity past. Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures, AKA it was, AKA it was planned. It was an event in history. Jesus actually came, right? He died on the cross, that was an actual event. And there was an achievement to that event, right? He died, but he didn't just die, he rose from the dead. Sins were paid for. And an achievement for that event was extended to the world. A free offer was given. And then there's an application to you and me when by faith we come to him and we are forgiven. We have become justified. And lastly, as 1 Peter 3.18 would say, we are brought to God. So I thank John Piper for that summation of the gospel, and I get that. And, and, but really, the hard part of that truth, especially for parents, is we tend to gravitate to the idea that, oh, the gospel is a set of beliefs that we need to kind of get in the heads of our children. But then we're not sure how to get these beliefs, how that should play out in their daily lives. The problem is that if we don't get that correlation between the gospel message and how it impacts how we do life, if we don't get that, how can we influence others? Right? How, how can we influence our kids to embrace the gospel for themselves? Leslie Newbegin says, states this, he says, the Christian story provides us with a set of lenses, not something for us to look at, but something to look through. Did you catch the significance of that? We don't just stare at the gospel. It's like it's a set of glasses that we put on in which we see our world. Really, as parents, we need to make that our goal, right? To help our kids not just understand the gospel, but encourage them to live it out. Live it out in the way that the gospel becomes the lens to which we view life by. And the only way to be able to do that is to have the gospel drive our behavior. You want a picture of what that looks like? Yeah, I want a picture of what that looks like. Okay, Romans 12, and we'll be looking at a variety of passages this morning, and you can follow along, and it'll be up on the screen as well. Familiar passage, right? Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living, does anyone know the word? Living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So our bodies, Paul says, hey, you are to be a living sacrifice. That means that somehow, how we do life has to have an element of death to it. If I could be very candid with you this morning, and again, I'll pick a little bit on families. If in our families, if the gospel is just something that we explain, 
but we don't live it out, we're in trouble. Isn't it true that in one sense the Christian life is easy? It's like, it's like a free gift. It brings eternal life. It brings freedom and life. But is also incredibly difficult. Right? Because it means dying to our way of doing things. That's why Jesus would say in, in Mark 8.34, said this, and, and calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his, his cross, yeah, and follow me. But again, we're called to live life, and but there, there's some sort of death language going on here, right? Deny, take up your cross, living sacrifice. Oh, does that, does that sound like us? And here's the point. By design, the gospel creates uh, in us an entire way of life. Consider for a moment Paul's words in um, Colossians 1, 5 to 6, and you'll, you'll see this new life that we have in Christ. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, and increasing deed in the whole world is bearing fruit. I want you to pay attention to that. And increasing as it also among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. You know, when we come to passages like this, I think, you know, we kind of zero in in words like hope and heaven, and truth, maybe even the gospel, which is a good thing. But don't you find it's really easy to skip over words like bearing fruit, increasing? The reality is, if you think the Christian life is about getting to a certain mark and plateauing, you've missed the point. Because the gospel by its nature doesn't even allow that. You see, what, see, what we have in Christ is to bear fruit, and it's to increase in bearing fruit. You know, it's a great thing to be able to explain the gospel, you know, especially if you have kids. But more, the more challenging question is this. Have you shown the effects of the gospel growing in your life, right? Ah, so are you starting to see some of the challenge that's before us? At first pass, it seems what I'm saying is, I kind of get it, but it, it seems kind of elusive to me. I, I mean, we understand that the Bible teaches that the Son of God emptied himself when he came into this world. We understand that Jesus Christ became a servant, just like Isaiah said. We regularly try to visualize Jesus dying on the cross as our substitute. We rejoice, right? We sing songs about Jesus rising from the grave, and we give thanks. All of that we understand, we teach that. But again, the question of the day is, how do we make that set of truth has become the lens to which we view life and view this world by. If you are a parent and the gospel isn't the lens to which you see life by, can I just tell you, it's going to be especially hard for your kids to really fall in love with the gospel message. So again, the question, how did we develop a gospel lens in which we can view life? Well, a good starting point is what Tim Keller referred to as the upside-down effect of the gospel. Sounds kind of weird, right? Maybe a little unusual, but in fact, it's very helpful and very powerful because it's, it's talking about reversals, and they are part of the gospel message. For example, right? Jesus is the king, right? Yet, he became a servant. A reversal. And a king who became a servant, there's similar types of reversals in his kingdom. Let me just read for you what Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, chapter 6, verse 20. He said, And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day. Leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich. For you have received your consolation. 
Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. So did you see the reversal there? You know, Jesus' kingdom, the poor, the sorrowful, the persecuted, they're above the rich. They're, they're, they're recognized above them. The, the poor are even above the satisfied. If you're familiar with Philippians chapter 2, you know that Paul picks up on that type of thought. He said that Jesus is, is king, yet he served. Though he is the greatest, he made himself servant of all. Think about the victory of Jesus on, on the cross, right? He didn't triumph over sin by taking up power, but by being a sacrificial servant. In other words, this might blow your mind. He won by losing everything. That is the pattern of the gospel. There is gain in what seems to be from the world's eyes, loss. Jesus said it this way in John 12. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for, etern for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will, be my servant, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Wow! You're talking reversal. This is, this is the opposite of what our, our culture teaches. But let's be honest. That mindset's just not the norm, right? What is our culture value? Power, recognition, wealth, status, not humility in serving others. You know, I, you know, I think, I, I hope, as long as I have breath, I'll in some way be involved in youth ministry to some degree. I just simply love being involved with the next generation. But it's also tough Right When you see, say, teens act selfishly, who intellectually you know they know all about the gospel, but there just seems to be no evidence that they've learned to see life through the lens of the past week. So if you have children at home, I'm going to ask you a tough question. Based on your past week, what do your kids say that you value? Because here's the deal. If our kids, if we want them to see the gospel living in us, they need to see in us some type of servant community. Right? Doesn't that just make sense? That means we need to live out an entirely different life. Dying to ourselves and living for Him. That means that we're not consumed with making money at the expense of others. It means our goal in life is it's not to be the most popular. It's not about seeking recognition. And I'm honestly not trying to be dramatic. But really the issue is this. If the people around us, especially our kids, don't see this type of reversal in our priorities as we do life in front of them, they are missing seeing a key element of the gospel in action. Because they need to see the upside down effect in our life. Okay, so moving from the upside down effect, now we're going to look at the inside effect of the gospel. Are you still with me? Okay, and then to start with, if I could generalize, and this is just my opinion, okay? This is just Sean's opinion. I, I think largely the generation before mine often saw the Bible as information to be learned and rules to be maintained. Okay, and that created a, a breeding ground for legalism. But again, that's just my opinion. But I can tell you for sure that a biblical picture of what that could look like is the religious leaders of Jesus' day. I think we can all agree on that. Right, these guys, they, they were the poster children for legalism. They had the external aspects of the Old Testament. They had that down pretty good. If it was behavior that you could see in public, oh, they nailed that. That was just like, they were right on that. But their hearts were unchanged. Jesus put it this way in Luke 11. And the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees, cleanse the outside of the cup 
and, the, and of the dish. But inside you're full of greed and wickedness. You fools, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give as alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. Sadly, I think churches across our land are full of people that like look good from the outside, but are ignoring the dirt on the inside. And much of that comes from our lack of commitment to view life through the lens of the gospel. So, so we might understand the gospel message, but we fail to live it out the way the Bible teaches. Think about what happens if we think that life, life change occurs simply by keeping rules. Right? How sad is that? Oh, that God's going to love me and accept me if I just keep the right rules? If that happens, I'm telling you, we're in trouble. Because the gospel is the reverse of that. The, the gospel, gospel actually teaches that God accepts us freely by grace when we embrace Jesus as Lord and Savior. We need to understand that we are saved not by actions but by His merit. So, being cleansed from the inside out means we understand that the obedience comes not out of compulsion or pride but out of inner joy and gratitude. Think, Think of this, if, if we, we get, get that, that, that totally changes how we relate to God. God. It's, it's a total game changer how we relate to ourselves and in others. And that's part of how God changes us from the inside out. Let me ask you this, do you believe what you truly believe about the gospel comes out in the way you do life? And that's kind of a confusing statement, let me just say it again. Do you believe what you truly believe about the gospel comes out in how you do life. I sure do. Think about when we sin against our family. And we choose not to make it right. Think of the message that we are, are telling those that we're doing life with. And, and if you have kids at home, what are you telling your kids when you belittle your spouse? Or you demand something like, oh, vacations, it's got to be this way. Or, or consider something as simple as we give the grocery clerk a hard time or we complain about a this or a that. I'm telling you, those things send volumes to those watching us about how committed we are to the gospel message. Here's the deal. When things are not going our way, it really is in those instances that we are How about this for perspective? If you are here today and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, like you know that you know that you know if you die today, you'd be going to heaven. You're born again. Right? Praise God for that, right? And if that is you, that means this for you. That means by grace, your greatest, your greatest problem, right, is, which is your sin, you know that, it's been looked after. It means your greatest need, which for, for a Savior, it has been met. Consider this then, the message of pride and ingratitude that we show when we choose not to extend grace to someone who just cut us off in traffic. Right? Or we tear or strip off the person at Tim Hortons for getting our order wrong. Please don't get me wrong. I, I'm not trying to call us to perfection. But the question I'm really trying to get across is, is the gospel changing you? Because if the gospel isn't changing you, why should those around you believe it's going to change them? You know, I'm all for students sharing their faith in public school. I think that, that's so awesome. But here's the thing. It'd be hard for others to believe that message if their life is no different than the lives of those around them, right? I'm all for sharing your faith in the workplace. But it's a hard message for them to believe if they see you ripping off the company. See, the people of Isaiah's day, they had God's word, right? They had religion. In Isaiah's words, you remember this, they were blind, or they had eyes, but they were what? Sorry, I already gave it away. They had eyes, but they were blind, right? They had ears, but they were what? Yeah, see, I didn't give that one away. But anyways, in other words, they thought, hey, I'm all good with God. 
right? If you were to take a poll of them and say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm good, I'm good. But the, the reality was they were completely disconnected. And how did you know that? It came out in how they did life. So my Isaiah type warning to you is this. If the gospel is not changing you, you may have a bigger problem on your hands. This phrase is not unique to you, but let me warn you of this. If your faith hasn't changed you, then it hasn't saved you. And let's be honest, we can't expect the gospel to change us if we've never truly embraced it for ourselves. Well, you've been very patient so far. We've had the upside down effect, we've had the inside effect, and, and if you think that is hard to remember, you're going to love this one, because this one, I want you to consider the forward back aspect, aspect of the gospel. And I recognize we're getting a little low on time, but I, I want to give you an idea how rich the gospel is. And, and to help you understand why the gospel is to be influencing your daily life, let me just share with you a powerful element of the gospel that you may have never considered before. See, the gospel recognizes that Jesus' arrival of king happens in two stages, right? He, he came once, and when he did that, he saved us from the penalty of sin and death. He gave us the presence of the Holy Spirit as a down payment for an age to come. But scripture tells us that he is coming again to complete what he began in the beginning. And we remember, when we talked about Isaiah 42, we talked about that several times. And when Jesus comes again, Sin and evil will be removed. We, he's going to bring about a new creation in our world that's going to be cleansed of all brokenness. And here's why I want to stretch you a little bit. Because this truth is a reality now, but these events have not fully come to pass just yet. It's an already but not yet type deal. Oh, you're counted and winners declared. And we don't think something is a reality until, you know, the votes are cast, you're counted and winners declared. You know, I don't think we've ever seen a gold medal given to someone who didn't win the race. You remember Hussein Bolt, how fast that guy was, and you knew when he would line up there. You knew that he was going to win this, right? It was just a given. But no one's going to put a gold medal around his neck until he actually runs the race and actually finishes first. And here's the thing, and this is the stretch for us, because Christ's kingdom is not like that. His return, his future judgment, but it has not occurred yet. In other words, you can bank on it now. That means your life today, you need to be living it out in the reality of his return. And just as there was no power in the universe that could stop Jesus from conquering sin and death on the cross, there is also no power in the universe that can stop his return and his coming judgment. Yeah, thank you, Bob. And that means for us as believers and as parents and as a church, we need to live life today in light of that future reality. So what does that mean for us doing life today in terms of helping us? Remember, we, we want to be able to view life through the lens of the gospel. Well, let's go back to the family example again. Right, if your kids see you coming on Sunday and they hear you sing about Christ's return and his coming kingdom, and they watch how you, then how you prioritize your life. And it's kind of like, well, you're pri prioritizing as if Christ has never come back. Right? And think of the message that we're communicating. Unfortunately, what we're telling them, the gospel is something, oh, we might confess, but your heart is not really there. Don't get me wrong. I don't think there's wrong, anything wrong about being passionate about a sport or a certain hobby, especially if it's dogs, trucks, or guitars. But anyways, just saying. But let me ask you, is what you're passionate about is it preparing you and those around you for Christ's return? Right? Tough question. Is how you're spending your time and what you're spending your money on in terms of reaping eternal gain, is it doing anything? When we begin to internalize the reality of Christ's future kingdom, I'm telling you, our, our passions will just naturally change. For example, we're, Lord willing, we're going to run another Alpha program. And, and here's the thing. I, it's not my style, and I, don't, and I don't think it will do any good to try guilt you and to try invite someone to Alpha. And here's why. Well, actually, I should say this is what I really want to try to do: is I want to try to get you to see the light, your life through the lens of the gospel, believing 
And if you do that, hey, then being a testimony for Jesus, being a witness for him, oh, I'm just going to naturally want to do that. Or another example, we know that when Christ comes, he'll overcome oppression. So well, if that's important to him, then, and, and then why don't that be important to us right now? We know that Jesus cares for his community, right? And, and if that's his priority, hey, well, maybe we could prioritize the community. Oh, hey, maybe we could do that with helping in camps or maybe in the garden ministry or, or maybe our, our moms and parents group or, or oh, I, I got something really radical that we could do that could impact our community. Let's start a church in Baden. You see, the gospel by design changes everything. Keller said that the gospel is not just the ABC of the Christian life. He said it's the A to Z of the Christian life. And this is what we need to understand. The gospel just doesn't save us and then, you know, go do your own thing until you're six feet under. The gospel saves us, but then the work of the gospel is to transform every part of our being. Oh, the gospel is to impact our hearts, our minds, and our actions by us believing the gospel more and more deeply as we get older. But please don't think that the gospel is about performance. It's, it's not that, and if that's what I've communicated, I've communicated poorly. It is about dying to ourselves. It, 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 we die to our old way of life. And if we want to unleash the power of the gospel, we need to realize, and here's, this is a powerful statement. It says, we realize that we are more sinful and flawed than we could ever imagine. I am more sinful and flawed than I could have ever imagined. We need to understand that, but here's the flip side of that. We understand that we are more accepted and loved than we could have ever have hoped for. So if you get this upside down effect, right, and the forward, backward, and you really want um, the gospel to be the A to Z of your life, right, you're, you're in. Like if I could ask for a show of hands, that you, your hand would be right up or sign, yeah, I would, I would sign up for that. You want that. Can I assure you of this? If, if that is your heartbeat, I, I just want to give you some hope. Because if that is your heartbeat, I assure you that the gospel will also protect you. You see, by allowing the gospel to continually transform us, it protects us from all sorts of dangers. You see, as the gospel continues to transform us, no longer are we trying to earn acceptance from God. No longer are we trusting our feelings to determine truth. Did you know that if the gospel is really kicking in on us and transforming us, your relationships will blossom because no longer you're not using people to get what you want, right? You're not looking to people to, to, to be your identity. You just genuinely love and want to serve people. And, and you know that your sufficiency is in Christ and in Him alone. We know that we are no longer a slave to our desires. Paul said this in Titus 2, 1 to 12. He said, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, upright in godly license present age. That is where the gospel takes us. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, upright in godly license present age. That is where the gospel takes us. It does so by giving us a new appetite and a new affection. I'm telling you, if we get this, there is a joy and a freedom because we are learning the depths of God's grace that's been offered to the hopeless sinners like you and I. Here's the thing. If you want to experience more joy in your life, can I, can I just give you a few things here? How about this? Develop a willingness to admit your faults. And this might strike a few nerves, but how about this? How about being gracious to those that don't entitled and self-absorbed? How about this? Stop being, feeling so entitled and self-absorbed. Falsely believing that life is all about you. I'm telling you, when we make those changes, there is gonna, you're going to experience a, a different type of life where it brings joy because we're no longer trying to elevate ourselves. Because what we want, our desire is for Jesus to be exalted in everything that we say, everything that we do, and everything that we think. You've been very patient. Let me just share one more passage before 
we close. And, and, uh, and if you're into writing things on your fridge or you want to learn a verse with your family or just you're single just by yourself, I'm telling you, this, this would be a good one. Paul said this, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So what does the gospel life look like? Well, I think humility would be a good word. He stops seeking our own glory for ourselves. You know, we're all naturally built to have aspirations. But here's the thing, if we don't find those aspirations in Jesus, if, if our life and our, and our families are about fulfilling our pleasures, building our kingdom, you are going to find yourself on an unreachable journey. Because true contentment is only going to come when you put others first. Christ's humiliation is our grounds to put others before ourselves. Jesus emptied himself. And the only way for you and I to fight the flesh is to root our foundation in him. And so we need to have the attitude of Jesus, which is available to you and I right now. What a reverse of what our culture knows. We are to lead by serving. When C.S. Lewis would say at humility, he says, true humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. So let's teach our families to think less of ourselves and more about the great king. Let's make it our prayer that the gospel will affect everything. So then we can allow the gospel to see, be the lens to which we see life. Are you in? I'm in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we come before you. And Lord, in, in some ways, Lord, what we have studied is, again, simple to understand. But it wages war within us. We just have this natural tendency to see life through our sets of eyes and not yours. Lord, forgive us when we don't live life and in light of, the, of eternity, when we put our needs above others, especially if we're in a family context, when we just kind of selfishly make decisions that suit us and, and not those around us. Lord, we want to be bold in our faith, but we also want to have lives that display the very essence of the gospel. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would work powerfully in our midst. Lord, I'm asking you for breakthroughs. I'm asking you, Lord, to reach the hard ground. Lord, that you would just break it up with the beauty of your word, with the truth of your son. And Lord, I pray if there's someone here has never embraced the gospel, never accepted Christ as their Lord, Lord, that today they would not leave this room until they make that decision. Lord, we want to be sold out for you. And we ask by your grace 